How's it going and welcome back to the channel. My name is Gavin and as always, I hope this video finds you well and that you're having yourself a good day. But today we're gonna be diving into yet another new series or type of video that I wanna make a prominent part of the channel. Last week we added the Friday Fade series where I'll be talking about a couple of players every week. You can go back and watch last week's episode if you like to. I'll link that in the description of this video. But we talk about a couple of players that not necessarily aren't guys I dislike, but are players that I don't really love at their current ADP and where they're being drafted at. So I talk about them as some bad value plays and that there's other players that would be more suited to be taken advantage of at their draft position. So today, the name of the game is going to be an ADP battle. We're talking about Kelvin Ridley versus AJ Brown and making sure that we make the right draft choice on our league's draft day, which is obviously the most important singular date of our entire fantasy season. So make sure you go down, like this video, and subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. I want each and every single one of you watching this to join the SFS community because I'm striving to make this the most interactive fantasy channel there is out there. I'll reply to all comments you've got for me. Any questions, join up that community discord. It's free and the link to that is in the description of this video. It'll redirect you to my website where you can click on the discord icon, which will then prompt you to be invited to that server where there's a bunch of stuff for you to take advantage of. So make sure to jump, jump into that Discord and get involved here. I want to talk and engage with each and every single one of you. So let's hit the intro and dive into AJ Brown versus Calvin Ridley and which one is better suited for your fantasy teams in the 2021 season. Again, so the purpose of this video is to decide and to break down which one of these players is the better draft choice and the better selection at their current ADP. So if the board falls to you in both of these players who both have tremendous upside, who are both extremely talented, if they're both there, we wanna make the correct decision and make the choice that gives us the best opportunity to obviously finish off our leagues and win that ultimate championship prize which you can't do with just one draft pick, but we can try and go down the board here and make every correct decision and throughout this off season, build a really strong portfolio of information and gather a really good collection of details and analysis on every player on the board, or at least as many of them as we can cram in here. And obviously sizzlefancy.com, that's where I host my redraft uh, draft collection and draft guide set for you this season. I'm breaking down my top 250 players and writing out in-depth profiles for each of them on top of having positional rankings and tier by tier analysis. I'll be doing a draft day cheat sheet. All that stuff is in beta right now. It, the target date that I wanna be done with all that is August 1st, but I have at least a baseline rating set out there right now and I'm about 35 out of 250 of those draft profiles done. So myself and Eric, until August 1st for the next four and a half weeks or so, we're gonna be trying to crank through the rest of those and get those done in a timely fashion and get as much additional videos, articles, and other content that we can get out there for you all. And if you just want those rankings, you're not interested in those profiles, you can also become a monthly member of the SFS Gold community, which you only gotta pay for one month if that's all you want, it's less than $5 a month. You can get access to some additional content and articles through that as well as we post more content on there. And there's already a startup um, group of content on there for you to take advantage of. But just to kind of start out this video here, get some context on these players, figure out what is our baseline, what are we looking at here for AJ Brown and Calvin Ridley. AJ Brown right now is going roughly in 12 team leagues with the 19.5 overall draft pick. This ADP is based off of Sleeper Fantasy and the average draft positions that they have over there, which I think is an incredible site to take advantage of. Whenever I do a dynasty league, I'm on sleeper fantasy because they've got some really good pick trading tools and whatnot. And I think that overall their, their ADP is a good reflection of how the community feels based off of their various settings and scoring formats. And I just think it's a really nice app to use for those fancy leagues because they have a lot of those really nice tools uh, and things to take advantage of on their site. So AJ Brown, excuse me, the 19.5 overall pick, you're looking at roughly a mid to late second round pick. Obviously, the second round is picks 13 through 24. So you're looking at a player who is hovering just about around that last third of the second round there. And then Kelvin Ridley is going with the 21.4 pick. So just two spots later 
in that second round, creeping very close to the end of that overall round on the board. This, uh, if we want to put this in some more context here, DK Metcalf is going at the 16.3, so an early second round pick just before these two players, and then just after them, Justin Jefferson is going at the 25.4 to start off that third round. Those are the, the two receivers that are kind of sandwiching them in here based off of that average draft position. So recapping the 2020 season, we'll talk about A.J. Brown first here. Brown hauled in 70 of 106 targets for 1,073 yards, 11 touchdowns, and he averaged out 14.9 fantasy points per game. That's actually a pretty solid marker to be at. And A.J. Brown was right around that wide receiver 11 marker. He only played 14 games. He had some issues with a knee injury at the start of the year, and he actually played the whole season somewhat injured and dinged up. So that's something that is important to take into consideration as well, is that we didn't even see Brown at his best last season. And there's a very good chance that his actual capability of having better on-field production when he's healthy is a lot greater than what we saw from him last season, which was still very impressive numbers and very impressive production. And the thing that I liked the most about A.J. Brown last season is that he was able to gather 26% of the target share in that Tennessee offense. But there are some other things to talk about here. There's some reasons that I have, some drawbacks, some red flags, some concerns with A.J. Brown, who's one of my favorite players in the NFL and someone that I actually really, really like. And I was all over drafting prior to that acquisition of Julio Jones a couple weeks back. And we'll talk about that and dive into why I think that makes this situation a bit more risky and a bit unfavorable. And very clearly, Kelvin Ridley and A.J. Brown have seen very similar, or I guess they're more so contrasting um, benefits and withdraw or drawbacks from that Julio Jones aftermath. And that's something, again, we're going to be talking about in today's video. So Corey Davis for the Titans last season obviously departed in free agency, and you're somewhat swapping him out for Julio Jones, filling that second wide receiver role. And A.J. Brown has actually already come out and said he wants to defer the wide receiver one target numbers. And in the football to Julio Jones, obviously they're basically mirror images of each other. A.J. Brown has, has shaped his entire NFL game after Julio Jones. He idolizes him, looks up to him. And now they're playing on the same team together, which is pretty cool and pretty surreal for A.J. Brown as a player. But I'm not sure it bodes so well for his fantasy value. Corey Davis, in terms of that wide receiver two role for the Titans last season, caught 65 of 92 targets for 984 yards. So extremely efficient numbers, him and A.J. Brown. On Neither of them saw a ridiculous 130, 140 target seasons. I'd said A.J. Brown only saw 106 targets last year. But these guys were still having a really great yards per catch ratio and were still going out there and getting it done despite this team not being an air raid system whatsoever and having nearly 400 touches of their entire offensive production going to that big man, Derrick Henry, in the backfield. So for what they have in the passing game, they sure made their markers worth it and they sure produced and lived up to the output potential these are players that are very, very talented. So only five TDs for Corey Davis last season, but he still had 23% of the target share. So again, 26% for AJ Brown, 23 for Corey Davis. Those are really high numbers for a wide receiver one and two in an offense. And I think that, that those numbers, if we want to put some context behind that, that's what we like to do here. I don't like to just toss raw numbers at you without telling you what they mean. I think that the main takeaway from this is that when you have literally 49%, so nearly half of your team's passing production coming from just two players, that's a pretty good indicator that this most likely isn't a very heavy passing volume team. If you look at some other teams out there like the Chiefs, between Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill, that's a much more high ceiling passing volume offense in two much more extreme cases of seeing a lot of targets on the football field. They're still hovering around that 50% marker, but the overall passing volume they have in that second 50% is still a lot greater than what the Titans have left over for their roster because you're looking at guys like a Janu Smith and Anthony Ferkser to, to carry out the back end of that group, and, and there's not too much production after that. So A.J. Brown, Corey Davis, the main two pass catchers for this Titans offense last season, but now we're trading out Julio Jones for Corey Davis. So I want to talk about Julio Jones for just a second here because this has a major impact and has 
major implications for how I see AJ Brown's fantasy value playing out for this coming season. If we pace Julio's season out in 2020, which was by far a down season for him, an underwhelming year, we didn't see the best production from him. We didn't see the heights of his prime. Obviously, he's probably in the twilight and dwindling down in his overall production because he's just getting older. He's entering his age 32 season. I think Julio's best days are behind him. So I think it's a pretty fair assumption to say if we take that down season, which was still pretty productive if you pace him out to that full 16-game schedule. He only played nine games last season. I think that it's a good starting point and something that we can at least consider, especially when you take into consideration the Titans' offensive passing attack is far less from a volume perspective than it would have been in Atlanta. Taking a down year seems like it's a fair evaluation of what his numbers might be potentially this next year as a Titan. So nine games played in 2020 for Julio. If we pace that out, he had about 100, he would have, excuse me, had about 120 targets last season, 7.5 targets per game. And he only had three touchdowns last season. So I I don't really want to factor that in too heavily because I think that as a member of the Falcons, he was getting pretty harassed in the end zone and down in the red zone. Teams wanted the Falcons to beat them anyway, but with Julio Jones. I think when you add an A.J. Brown into the mix here, Julio might get back to that 8-10 to touchdown marker because there's another significantly large offensive target and weapon to be used down there that they're going to have to try and stop. So I actually think that while Julio might have only scored 5 or 6 touchdowns last season with the Falcons because they were literally crowding him every time they got down there in the red zone, they're going to have to diversify how they want to split up their defense and give him some other avenue or, or excuse me, give the other, um, give the Titans some other looks because when you've got Derrick Henry and AJ Brown on top of Julio Jones, you've got three beasts that you have to try and contain and try and guard. It's going to be a menace for defenses to try and stop. So 7.5 targets per game. This is a really important marker for me because, well, why, I guess. AJ Brown also saw 7.5 targets per game last season. So you're talking about two players who literally have the same skill set, who have the same, I would say, upside and play style coming in with their 2020 seasons would have had literally mirrored the exact same numbers. And A.J. Brown, the one thing that set the two apart, he played five more games and he had a lot more touchdown production than Julio Jones did with the Falcons last season. So you bring these players both in, you already have a limited number of passing work to work with And you're asking both of these players to be essentially wide receiver ones for fantasy football purposes. We see, obviously, the effects of age, inconsistent play from Julio, and just the drawbacks of maybe filling the wide receiver two role. Who knows? It's tough to really say, to be honest, who is going to step up and assert themselves as the one in this offense. But right now, it's it's being valued very clearly in fantasy that A.J. Brown is that player, as his ADP is in the late second round as compared to Julio, who we're looking at more as an early fourth round pick. These are players that are still pacing out to have roughly the same amount of output in this coming season, because if you were to pace out, again, I said A.J. Brown only played 14 games. They both had 7.5 targets per game. You're looking at literally 120 targets evenly for the two players next season. I don't know if that volume is going to be there. For the Titans last season, Ryan Tannehill only had 481 passing attempts. If you put 240, that's 120 combined for the two players. That's literally 50% of his passing attack will be going to one of these two players. I think it could potentially happen, but I think that at the end of the day, these two players are going to have to eat into one or another's fantasy value, and someone is going to take the hit, and and it might be both of them. There's a very real potential and possibility that A.J. Brown and Julio Jones kind of diminish each other's overall upside. And when you look at, you know, Julio used to be a guy that would see 8, 9, 10 targets per game. That number is just naturally going to be lower because of the nature of this offense. So I already think the volume is significantly strapped for both of these players. We're going to see some stinkers out of both of these guys at different points in the season because it's inevitable that someone's going to have a down week. Someone isn't going to perform up to standard. And when you're already working with less than eight targets per game, you're going to have to be incredibly efficient with each and every single one of those opportunities you get. And if you're not able to maximize the output that you get with those chances, there's a chance that this could turn into a lot more of a risky situation. I think people are giving it credit for currently. And then again, if you're looking at an A.J. Brown, a Corey Davis, 
those two with both of them having under 120 targets last season and if that's what we want to project them for this season I don't know if if there is room for that in this offense and yes Julio Jones I would tell you is a better wide receiver than Corey Davis but when you look at him as a player who combined AJ Brown and Corey Davis had under 200 targets last year and we want to project these two players in the 2021 season for 40 more targets I guess they could get there with the extra game but we're asking for a bit more than the Titans showed us they have to work with last season. Maybe they bring down the volume of Derrick Henry's work because players typically don't come back from 400 touch seasons as the same type of player. But again, one more time here, there's risk that I think a lot of people aren't calculating into this offense. And I think that again, one more time, they can be incredibly efficient, but that's what they're going to have to do in order to be productive players. So Matt Ryan, one more thing I want to talk about, 534 passing attempts, so 53 more passes the Falcons threw than the Titans last season. Atlanta averaged 39.2 passing attempts per game, which ranked fourth in the entire National Football League last season. Tennessee, only 30.1, which ranked 30th, so literally in the bottom three of the entire NFL and how many times they passed the ball last season. So I think being optimistic here, and if we want to project them for a high-end side of things, Maybe we can hope for the low 20s is where they get to with having two better wide receiver options than they had in 2020. Maybe they increase that passing volume just a bit more because they're going to have the opportunity to hit play action balls over the top and again, be super, super effective with every passing attempt they have because the defenses are going to be so reeled in on Derrick Henry. But you're going to see a give and take here. Some teams are going to want to stop Derrick Henry and go all out in that aspect of things. Some teams are going to let the Titans beat them on the ground with Derrick Henry and make sure they can't throw the ball over the top with Julio Jones and A.J. Brown. So it's a situation I think is certainly risky, and I'm not entirely excited about now that Julio has been added into this offense. I was crazy excited when Josh Reynolds was the wide receiver too here in Tennessee because I thought there was absolutely no factor that was going to dig into A.J. Brown's workload. But now that's certainly a prevalent factor here and something that we have to heavily assess when when taking his 2021 fantasy value into consideration. So moving more into the Calvin Ridley side of things, who I think if you just listen to that, you can clearly see he is the benefactor here. He's the player that got the better side of things in this Julio Jones aftermath for fantasy football purposes. Obviously, if you're a Falcons fan, if you are the Atlanta Falcons, if you're players on this team, you'd probably rather still have Julio Jones there. But He's not anymore. He's a Titan. He's going to be eating up A.J. Brown's workload, or at least some of it. And now Kelvin Ridley has his time to thrive here and his time to shine as an Atlanta Falcon, which he already did last season with 143 targets. He hauled in 90 of those and had 1,374 yards, nine touchdowns, and 25% of the target share. Yes, he saw less target share as a Falcon than A.J. Brown did as a member of the Tennessee Titans. But remember, the Falcons threw the ball nine more times per game last season than the Titans did. That's plenty of opportunity right there and puts into context why it's more valuable to be receiving even a lesser piece of the Falcons workload than it is to be receiving a larger workload and very, very slightly larger workload by only 1% there of that Titans offense because they're passing the ball nine fewer times per game. So you talk about Calvin Ridley, he already proved he could be a wide receiver. 143 targets with Julio Jones on the field for nine games last year. Yes, he still had the opportunity to, and and Calvin Ridley only played 15 games, but he still had the opportunity for five or six games with Julio off the field to put up that stat line and to prove to us that he can be the guy. He beat coverages. He was good enough. He showed us that he can produce by himself on the field without the defense focusing in on another player. When he was that guy, he showed us He absolutely is that guy, and that's why he finished as the wide receiver for last season. And you talk about a Falcons team that's still a bad defense. They still have to improve at multiple areas on the field. They invested into a Kyle Pitts with their first uh, overall pick, the number four pick overall in the 2021 draft. They didn't go out there and try and solve their issues at the defensive back, the, the defensive pass rush positions. They went all in on offense here, and yes, they departed from Julio Jones, and, and yes, I think that... Uh, Kyle Pitts will see a a very real amount of work and time in this offense, but I'm not so sure it's going to be right away. And I actually thought to myself, what if Kyle Pitts completely absorbed Julio Jones's production from last season? I don't think that's something that's completely unrealistic when you talk about Julio being a proven top three wide receiver in this league for the last decade or so. 
and I think that coming in as a rookie tight end, you have to manage your expectations. I've talked about that a lot on the channel as Kyle Pitts. Uh, I put him in my must fades video last week because I just don't think that we can justify right now taking him before a Mark Andrews or a TJ Hawkinson. And I don't think that we can expect Kyle Pitts to put up monstrous numbers as a rookie when he's got to have an adjustment. There's going to be a big time curve in an NFL where you've got to block a lot bigger players. You've got to face contact in the middle of the field from grown men. The college level is a lot different. Kyle Pitts is dominated there. He looks like an elite, elite talent, one of the best we've seen come out of the draft in a long, long time, but he's still going to have an adjustment. It's not going to come in day one and click and just become a dominant force in this offense. He needs time. So if Kyle Pitts were to come in, get 68 targets, haul in 51 of them, have 771 yards and three touchdowns, which was Julio Jones' stat line from last season. I actually expect that Kyle Pitts would maybe get somewhere around six to seven touchdowns. So even if we boost that number up a little bit, I still think Kelvin Ridley has all the opportunity in the world to produce. There's plenty of wide receivers that I love in fantasy football that have other more significant competition for target shares in their offense. You talk about a player like, and I think this one goes under the radar and isn't very considered here. Justin Jefferson saw an elite amount of targets with the Vikings last season while having to deal with Adam Thielen, who I think will see more targets than Kyle Pitts does this season. And while I don't like Adam Thielen at all in fantasy football this year because he was so incredibly touched on dependent last season, it still shows that while I, I, I still value a Justin Jefferson very highly, I think that you should be equally as as unconcerned about a Calvin Ridley having a Kyle Pitts as you are about a Justin Jefferson having an Adam Thielen. So yes, different positions, different teams. And the Vikings, to be honest, are are a run first football team. I would argue with Delvin Cook there that I still think that Justin Jefferson can put up elite wide receiver one numbers. And I actually feel better taking him over an AJ Brown because there's still more volume and opportunities to work with. So that kind of proves my point, my case in point right there. I am 100% Calvin Ridley over AJ Brown at this point in the fantasy season. I put Calvin Ridley right up there with maybe just behind a Stefan Diggs in that tier of the top five wide receivers list. If you want to go Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, Stefan Diggs, I'm really comfortable putting Calvin Ridley right behind them at that number four spot. Maybe right around DeAndre Hopkins territory. Maybe you give and take a little bit and DeAndre Hopkins might see even more volume because of the nature of that passing offense and the catch percentage that he has is right around 70%, which is absurd for a receiver. That might be something that we want to do as well, but it's all up to personal preference. But me personally, Calvin Ridley is a top five wide receiver in 2021 fantasy football. Based on my rankings, I'm putting AJ Brown after him. I'm absolutely drafting Ridley ahead of him. And for a player who's going two spots after, I think it's incredibly important that you too make this decision that yes, AJ Brown has a lot of talent and maybe I actually like him better as a player than a Calvin Ridley. But the situation for this season alone, adding in a Julio Jones, digging into his target share, decreasing his overall upside because he's not gonna have as many opportunities for double digit target games, double digit reception games, We got to go with Ridley here. The floor is safer because he's going to see more opportunities. I would argue the ceiling is also higher because he's going to see those targets and have the ability because he is such a talented player and we've seen him do it before to have those high scoring performances, to have those really efficient games, really high touchdown upside. I think that if Kelvin Ridley cracks into the double digit touchdown category marker this year, I wouldn't be shocked at all the first couple seasons in the league for him. That was pretty much his trademark and he was a predominant touchdown player in this offense, which was the main force behind his fantasy production. So Ridley over AJ Brown here, I would, again, like I said, Justin Jefferson's going at the 25.4. I would take Justin Jefferson before a uh, AJ Brown this season, because I think that he is just as talented of a player, maybe even a better route runner, has more uh, opportunity for targets and reception volume in that offense in Minnesota. So this kind of turned a little bit into a Ridley versus Jefferson versus AJ Brown ADP battle situation here. But the point being, A.J. Brown is a player that, although I absolutely love him and I think that he's an awesome player, I got to fade him down my board just a little bit. All righty, that'll settle my A.J. Brown versus Calvin Ridley debate. We got in a bit of a rant at the end of the video, but I really wanted to drive that point across that I really like A.J. Brown and I really see the value and the talent he has, which gives him the opportunity to produce in fantasy football. But when you talk about a player who just idolizes a Julio Jones so much, who is willing to defer opportunities, targets, and overall volume in this offense to a player who's much older than him coming into an already low passing volume offense. There's just too many things I don't like. And for a guy who's going two spots higher than a Calvin Ridley, who I just think has an overall better floor and ceiling, I think it becomes to a point here where 
I can't defend it any longer. And I think that we have to just accept the fact that Calvin Ridley is a top five receiver right now in fantasy football. He has the potential to finish as the wide receiver one overall if he stays healthy, produces up to his ceiling that I expect him to have, and hits those floor numbers on a weekly basis. You're looking at a really, really great opportunity, a guy who finished as wide receiver four and now doesn't even have Julio Jones in that offense anymore and is working with players who have to establish a role for themselves and don't already have one present in this offense. Because as great as Kyle Pitts can be, He's still a rookie, hasn't played a down in the NFL yet, and will have to carve out that role for himself. Uh, Russell Gage was really nice last season, but now being elevated into that number two wide receiver role is going to have to reprove that he can handle that work share in this Falcons offense. So thank you so much for watching today's video. Let me know in the comment section down below, are you on AJ Brown's side or are you team Calvin Ridley with me? I'd be really interested to hear what you had to say. If you're team AJ Brown and you disagree with me, let me know why. I would love to hear it because I'm a huge AJ Brown fan. I have been since he was at Ole Miss in college. I really wanted my Packers to take him in the second round of that 2019 NFL draft. So let me know your thoughts down below. I'd be really interested to hear. And again, join that Discord up because we have that video about the SFS one year celebration that I want to get you all in there and have the opportunity to participate in a lot of awesome community events I want to do and make this a super interactive channel where I'm talking with you guys on a daily basis about all things fancy football. So thank you so much for watching today's video. I'll see you all next time. Peace out.